I went to Naval College to study as an elect electrical and communications engineer in the late 60s, 69 to 72, and uh, I graduated to become a uh, a radio electronics officer in the Merchant Marine, that's the Merchant Navy in the UK. And uh, I went to sea on board uh, ocean-going liners and the cargo ships, uh, passenger ships, tankers, all kinds of uh, vessels. I travelled the world about 20 times altogether, went to uh, clearly many cultures, uh, visited many countries, uh, became uh, familiar with many cultures. and. Uh, as I travelled, clearly travel broadens the mind, and uh, my eyes were opened, my mind was opened, and I became very interested in uh, the sun and how the sun affects uh, human behaviour. And uh, I decided that I'd spend time inquiring as to what mechanism might lie behind some of the perplexing unknowns of the day, for example, like how astrology works, uh, how the sunspot cycle works, what causes the sunspot cycle, uh, why ancient civilizations worship the sun. Uh, questions like that began to stir in my mind. And as the years passed by, I decided to address each one of those issues at a time. And uh, once I'd figured out how astrology works, that was about 1986, uh, how the sun affects uh, the life on the planet, then... Uh, I became very excited because it was like opening Pandora's box. Uh, everything just flew around, flew out of the box, and uh, it inspired me to look further into why, for example, the Egyptians worshipped the sun as the god of fertility, as did the Mayas and the Incas and the Celtic people. And uh, I began to draw all these threads. So the travel and the education came together. and. Uh, it was from there that uh, I started to make one discovery after another and that allowed me to arrive at the position I am in today where I have, quite frankly, no other questions to ask. <laughs> I notice in the, in the book, in the, uh, in the book it mentions that you worked at Cranfield University, which is a, a post, uh, post uh, baccalaureate ed uh, education center in the UK. Were you teaching? No, uh, from 89 to about 92, I was head of electrical and communications engineering on the management side of the university. So it was my job to look after all of the uh, electrical and communications requirements of the university campus and the airfield, because we had an airfield there as well. So uh, it was very much a management role, because when I was at sea, uh, about 19... Uh, 78 or thereabouts, the International Telecommunications Union brought out new regulations and basically the regulations were saying that in 10 years time if uh, a ship carried satellite communications they need no longer carry a radio officer. So I had to make a decision at that time what to do and I decided to go to business school so I went to uh, in about 1982 to 85, I returned to university, and I did three years at business school and got a, an honours degree in business. And uh, that was to prove very helpful when it came to publishing and writing, because uh, the law component of the course proved very useful when dealing with publishers and contracts and so on. Uh, so uh, when I went to Cranfield, not only did I take my electrical and communications engineering skills with me, but uh, I was in charge of half a dozen departments on the campus, whereby I had to increase the efficiency of all those departments, basically, and make the university profitable again. So it wasn't an academic role. The fact is, when I was there, clearly I established links with the computer centre, Cranfield Computer Centre, and we had a massive bank of deck computers, which were way ahead, well, not way ahead of the time, but way ahead of uh, conventional computing power in the UK. And I had one particular problem whereby I couldn't calculate the sunspot cycle. I'd found a way of calculating it, but the individual uh, calculations were taking an awful long time. I was very busy in those days. I only had about five, three hours of time a week on a Sunday. And uh, I sat down and tried to do the calculations, but it was proving a longer exercise than I anticipated. So I, got, I sat down with uh, one of the girls in the computer center, and I said, look, I've got a problem. The sun's got three, uh, two magnetic fields, and I'm trying to find out how they change in relation to the Earth's position. And I don't know when all three of these variables will get back together again after they've started. So can you put these numbers into the computer, write me a program, and let me know when they'll get back together? 
Well, uh, she did that, and uh, she said, how long do you want me to let it run for? I said, just keep it going for a couple of weeks, and let's see what happens. After a couple of weeks, she, she produced about 500, maybe 600 graphs, and I sat down and studied the graphs, and it became apparent that the sun had a cycle of 187 years and a longer cycle of 18,139 years. And uh, then it became apparent that these two cycles were a result of a, a smaller cycle of 11.49 years. That's what we call the visible sunspot cycle, if you like, and this has been known for thousands of years since the ancient Chinese first observed it. They noticed that there were spots on the sun that appear periodically about every 11 and a half years, depending on the time you take into uh, the calculation, because it changes over time slightly. And uh, what I discovered was this 11.49 year cycle mixes with another cycle, and the two cycles together produce the 187 year cycle and the 18,000 year cycle. And uh, once I discovered that, I realized a particular number, one of the cycles, which was 3,000 or sub-cycles, let's call it a sub-cycle, was 3,740 years long. Now, I'd like to be specific on that number. It was actually 1,366,040 days long. That's what the computer told me. And as fate would have it, I was walking down the street in Plymouth one day where I worked, and I popped into a bookshop, and I opened a book on astronomy and archae ancient astronomy and archaeology. And uh, I was absolutely astonished when I learned that the ancient Maya of Central America worshipped a specific number, and it was exactly the same number, 1366040. Well, of course, you could have knocked me over with a feather because how could they have discovered what I discovered using the largest computer in the world? So I decided to study the the Maya, and I went down to Mexico, and a whole new door opened. And uh, that brings us to the book Future Science Today. Well, I definitely want to get into the book. uh, One more question about uh, your background and, and where you are these days. You worked at that university, which is an excellent university. I wonder... After the books that you've written, they've done so well, uh, sold three million copies, translated into 20 languages. I imagine you're not a popular guy with mainstream science or academia. Uh, could you work in a university level again, or are they pretty rough on you these days? No, uh, they're not rough, George. I don't think that's not the way I perceive it anyway. I think uh, I don't look at life like that. Clearly, they have their agenda. And uh, academics will not like the work I've just done in future science because I've put forward uh, uh, a whole uh, plethora of uh, discoveries. I've made a lot of discoveries that answer all of the questions of, questions of physics outstanding today. And, uh, you know, in the book I call them the 12 great mysteries of physics, which for me are, are great just simply fundamental questions which nobody in physics can answer now i've answered them all and in so doing i've been able to describe how gravity works and how uh, permanent magnetism works how electricity works at uh, atomic level and so on what makes the atom stable all of these questions now clearly if you are an orthodox physicist and an academic and you've spent a lifetime in science and been unable to make these discoveries for yourself Clearly, you're not going to be very happy with a person who comes along and says, well, everything you learned at college and your degree and your PhD is entirely wrong. And I can show you where it's wrong in a step-by-step way, and I can explain in great detail where it's gone wrong, and I can explain if we go back to where you went wrong and take the right direction, how we can begin to uh, fathom out what was really going on uh, with the atom when people started to misinterpret uh, what was actually happening in the uh, late 1920s and 30s when science went off course, basically. And uh, once we... Uh, I've often found that if a car finishes up in a ditch, the best way to, to figure out how the ca- what happened in the accident is to pull the car out backwards. It's no good trying to force it further into the ditch, pushing it forward. <laughs> and and I, I take the same view with uh, discoveries and science. If we need to find out the answers to science, we've got to go back, because clearly they've been looking for the wrong thing for 75 years. So we've got to go back 75 years and start again. And when we do that, we can understand where the people went wrong. Of course, coming forward to today, they're not going to be very happy when somebody comes along, because A, 
uh, as I say, makes their own qualifications redundant. And it's, it's, very, it's embarrassing for them that they couldn't have seen this themselves, especially when somebody points something out to you, because it's obvious when somebody else points it out to you. But when you've got to figure it out from your, for yourself, it's very, very difficult. Now, of course, I had a great deal of help from the Mayas, the Egyptians, the Inca, the Celtic people, the ancient Chinese. So I don't believe I figured this out by myself. I was able to decode a lot of the information and then uh, put it back into a modern uh, scientific context and then draw the inferences, which allowed me to build the complete picture. So just going back, do the, do the academics hate me? Well, first of all, they don't want to be unemployed. But if they accept how gravity works, then the funding will stop because they've been funded for the past 75 years trying to find a way how gravity works. And clearly, if somebody else has found it, then there's no point in going to the office tomorrow. Well, that makes me wonder how long it will take for them to give a fair hearing to your uh, concepts, as explained in this new book. It might be 50 years. I mean, well, we, the well, listeners of this program are well aware how stodgy mainstream science is about unpopular topics. Their unwillingness to give it a fair hearing. And I can imagine they wouldn't want to listen to your stuff at all. I agree entirely, uh, George. And normally, I, I would agree, about 50 years we have to wait until all the, science of the, the scientists of the day are dead, basically, and the new people come along with their open mind, who are tired of, have, of having the same old brainwashing run down their throats. And, uh, but this is <laughs> it's very difficult. I think you've got to read the book to realize that uh, the way I came by this knowledge, I was helped towards getting the answers. And they won't allow... The people who encoded this material will not allow criticism. It's, it's not permitted in their model of things. And because of that, they produce so much supporting evidence that you'd have to be some sort of weird person not to accept it. You'd certainly have to be irrational and illogical. And one of the things about gravity is, when I worked on it, is that not only did I discover gravity, but I discovered how to produce gravity waves, how to produce anti-gravity waves. And then I realized, once I'd done that, that anti-gravity waves would cause the molecular disintegration of matter. Now, what that means is uh, it takes us onto a new area of science because... One of the misconceptions of today is bonding, how atoms bond together. And what I've discovered is that there's three types of bonding. Two of them are conventional, which we understand. One of them is ionic bonding, where two ions, a positive and a negative, are attracted to each other. Another one is covalent bonding, which we all did at 15-year-olds in high school, where atoms share electrons. And the third type of bonding is little discussed. They call it hydrogen bonding because nobody understands how it actually works, because nobody understands how the hydrogen atom, two hydrogen atoms can bond because if they share electrons then there would be no electrons left because each hydrogen atom only has one electron it's the simplest of all atoms it's simply made up of one positive charge and one negative charge so it can't share an electron without smashing itself apart so for a while, there's been a separate school of thought that says, well, hydrogen must bond differently, but nobody knows how. Now, I understand what I've discovered is that hydrogen bonds gravitationally. And uh, so it's a gravitational field between hydrogen bonds that allows them to bond with other atoms. So if we use anti-gravity, what we do is break the molecular structure in those bonds. So if you shine uh, anti-gravity onto water, the, the molecular bonds holding the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms together break apart. So the water disintegrates into hydrogen and oxygen. So this means two things. One, by shining anti-gravity onto water, we can generate unlimited quantities of free hydrogen to power motor cars of the future and, of course, free oxygen. But, of course, if we shine it onto water-containing tissue, whether that's in human beings or any other living tissue, then the tissue will disintegrate. In other words, it will behave like a phaser gun on Star Trek. So... What will happen is scientists will try to ignore this for 50 years, but I suspect the Russians and the Chinese will have phaser weapons within 12 months from today, and that will make the scientific establishment sit up and take note of the discoveries in future science.